I worked for Travelers Insurance as a student actuary. One day, word was going around, Travelers, that there are these new things out there called computers that were going to take away all of their jobs. All the people in the Marchant machines, pretty soon they wouldn't have jobs. And so everybody was talking about it. They were scared they wouldn't have a way to make a living. But of course, it ended up being more jobs were created with the computers than there were with the Marchant machines. I worked for Professor Edward N. Lorenz. He had an LGP-30 in his office, and he taught me everything he knew about the LGP-30. Well, he'd hand me something saying, here's the instructions, that's what people used to do, right? So I saw they were advertising for programmers, and this was a new thing. I was hired to work on the um, ANFSQ-7. The XD-1 was the first ANFSQ-7, and it was at Lincoln Labs. I found out about the Apollo program, so I thought, I guess I should delay graduate school again, because I'd like to work on this program that puts all these men <laughs> on the moon. But there was this one a thing that they were worried about, what if um, the mission aborts? And everybody said, it's never going to. It just won't happen. Oh, well, good. We'll give this one to Margaret, because she's a beginner and is never going to go there anyway. And sure enough, it aborted. So it went to this program I had written, which I named Forget It. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I became an overnight expert. So I, was, uh, I concentrated on the system software and then gradually took on, in addition to the system software, the command module software, and around the Apollo 8 time, taking over all of the onboard flight software. The one thing that stood out in my mind, being in the onboard flight software, was that it was man-rated, meaning if it didn't work, a person's life was at stake, if not over. That was always uppermost in my mind, and probably many others as well. Uh, it had to be man-rated, and it had to work the first time. You had to simulate the hardware, you had to simulate you know, the vehicle and the world outside of it. So you had the hope that you simulated everything so it was as much like the real thing as you could get it to be. I started worrying about the astronauts. It worried me, what if there's an emergency? And they didn't know it. So I had a meeting with software and hardware people. So what I wanted to do was to interrupt the astronauts uh, to tell them there's an emergency so they'd stop doing what they're doing. So they said it can't be done. I said, why not? So I came back with a solution the next day. <laughs> they thought about it and they said, I think it can be done. The hardware guys got behind it. They put the stuff into the hardware and then the uh, Houston guys put it into their checklist for the astronauts. They practice, so it's in there for both the LEM and the command module, in case there's an emergency, whatever it might be. Now we go to Apollo 11, <laughs> and it's time to land. And all of a sudden, guess what comes up? Priority displays telling them there's an emergency. This is just before they land. And here were the things that I had wanted to do was to warn the astronaut when there's an emergency. There were too many things going on in the computer, and the astronaut knew that he had put the switch in a position that had caused extra stuff affecting the computer. And he realized, oh yeah, and he put it back in the right place, and they landed. After, um, the manned missions, I guess I personally just had a sense of history about wanting to not just remember things, but do something based on, on what lessons were learned. Just like when an error would happen, you'd find a way not to let it happen again. I got funding for, for this error study, we called it. We took those errors and came up with this theory of control and there were six axioms having to do 
at the time with software. In fact, the more you make use of this development before the fact mechanism that you adhere to it or make use of it, um, the more reliable it's going to be. I gave a talk at my college at Earlham where they want to know what is it like being in the engineering field and being a woman. That almost seemed to be worse in some ways today than it was back in the early days. When you see women not being allowed to drive in certain countries, or you see women can't become priests, and you start seeing it, and you know how I feel about system of systems of systems and the butterfly effect or whatever, Every single one of those things impacts our culture or impacts women or minorities as to whether they can even do something or not. Because kids might think, well, I can't do that because I'm this or I'm that. Until we start making changes, until our leaders stop admiring people who do things that encourage that, we have a problem, right?